Ah, wrong topic. Uh. All right, malware analysis. I, I'll actually double check that it's actually recording because um, last week I did I did this lecture that, and then at the end I checked and it had hadn't been recording through the whole lecture. But anyway, it's definitely recording now. Um, so that was for a different module, not this one. So malware analysis. So what we're talking about this week is how we investigate malware that exists to find out more about it. And you can imagine this might be some virus there. Yeah, okay, bit of a stretch. So, uh, so what is malware, right? So just quick revision, there's lots of different categories of malware and malware is generally categorized based on either how they spread or what they do. Generally, it's malicious software. So the author actually wants the so that, that software they've created to do something malicious. So uh, as opposed to a software vulnerability where the um, author is actually has good intentions but they make a mistake which results in the fact that it will, might be doing something that it's not supposed to do. So some categories of malware is like a virus, for example, which is where a program copies itself into other programs and spreads on the same computer, basically. A worm is malware that spreads across computers from one computer to another. Um, so for example, it might be exploiting vulnerabilities in remote systems or it might be sending spam emails and stuff to try and trick people into doing something like so, you know, sending an attachment to, to all your contacts and your contact list, for example. Trojan horses are basically software that um, has a covert and an overt operation, so it might look like it does one thing, but it actually goes off and does something else instead. So it might be, it, it looks like it's a game, but it actually, you know, is deleting all your files or letting someone else access your computer remotely. A rootkit is malware that basically hides the presence of an infection on your computer. It might hide certain processes or files so that if you're doing like process lists and file listing and things like that, you won't be able to see that there's something there even when there is. And um, a zombie process is basically a, a process running on your computer that, or, or a computer that is infected with malware that allows a remote person to take control of that system and often as a part of a botnet. So you have a botnet um, which has a number of zombie computers that basically are controlled by the, you know, the bot botnet master kind of thing. Um, so what's malware analysis? Basically, it's a study of malicious code. So if we come across a new piece of malware, you know, if we've just got an executable, like a .exe file, for example, how do we know that it's whether or not it's malicious? And so we can do some analysis on that program to discover some technical details about that program, but also information about how it behaves and what it does. So for example, the first question we might ask ourselves if we've got a, um, an executable that, we don't, that we're a bit suspicious of, that we find, is, is this actually a piece of malware that people already know about? Or is this something brand new? You know, is this like a targeted attack? Someone's literally just created this piece of malware and sent it straight to us, and no one else in the world has seen it before, for example. Um, if we can look at it and study it, what are the things that we could, you know, what are the indicators that a system's been infected? So is there certain network traffic that would indicate that this, you know, computer or network has been infected with this malware that we found? Or are there certain files on a computer that indicate that that malware is there? Um, and what type of malware is it? So, you know, is it a, a Trojan horse? Is it a worm? Is it a virus? Um, you know, a rootkit. So, what, you know, what is it actually doing? Um, who wrote it? Where does it likely originate from? What language do the, do the people who created the malware likely speak? What, when was it created? What date was it created on? Um, you know, what country is it potentially from? Um, where what does it put on your system? You know, does it, how does it actually have persistence? So does it install itself so that every time your computer starts, does that malware start up automatically? Um, and if we were going to remove it, how would we do that? Because it might be a number of processes and files spread throughout the computer and registry settings and things like that. 
So what are all the things we need to do in order to actually make sure it's not on a computer anymore? So that, that's, bas that's basically our aim. Um, and some of the reasons for doing that is as part of incident response. So if in an organization, for example, you, um, you know, had something happen, you found a very suspicious piece of software, you think your computer is infected with some malware, um, you want to know what was the actual damage and impact of that happening. You know, what information um, does that malware access? Or what did it access on your computer when it happened? And what actions does it and, and did it take? So, you know, is it likely to have copied all of our confidential files to a remote server? Or is it a keylogger and it's waiting for someone to come along and like pick up the file that has all the logs in it, for example? <coughs> um, you know, is this something very targeted? Or is it something that's just made its way onto our computer because it's just spreading across computers on the internet and one of our employees just accidentally opened something, for example? Um, or, you know, is it just, is it a worm and it's basically infected us because we've got a software vulnerability of a certain kind? Um, what do we need to do to actually recover our system? Um, and how are we going to prevent it in the, in the future? So what can we do to stop this from reoccurring? Another reason might be that we want to actually create some, um, you know, anti-malware signatures. We might work, you know, you might work for a company that does that for a living. You, your whole job might be doing this malware analysis where you're looking at samples of malware, finding out what you can about it, writing signatures so that in the future the software detects that, that that's what it is. And same with IDS and IPS systems, there might be some network traffic that it generates that is always going to generate something that looks similar, that we can write a rule for so that in the future we'll pick that up and say it looks like there's some malware involved. You're either being attacked by malware or your systems are already infected by malware that's coming from within your network. Um, so those are the sorts of things you can do to, to prevent it in the future but and also detect it um, in the future. So there's two big topics and ways of going about malware analysis and it's either it's static analysis and dynamic analysis. So static analysis is where you're basically looking at the malware um, while it's not running. So it's just looking at the file on your computer. There's not, no processes running. Um, say, for example, you find a file on the computer that's been infected, you copy that onto a USB, take it over to another computer and look at that file. There's nothing running, that's static analysis. Um, so it's offline analysis of the actual executable. And then there's dynamic analysis where you're actually analyzing it while it is running. So we might look at the processes that are involved, what's it, you know, what is it changing on an actual system. So if we run it on a, on a clean system and it makes a bunch of changes, we'll look at what those changes are. Um, we might look at some live analysis, like similar to what we did um, you know, the week before last when we were looking at live analysis for incident response. We'll look at what processes are involved, what files are they, con is, it, is it using, what network connections are there. Um, you know, what is in the memory for that process, what information is there, um, that can all be really, really helpful. So static analysis is obviously a lot safer, right, because um, you're not running malware on your computer. So you just need to make sure you're not accidentally running it. So for example, if you're on a Unix system, you, you would set it so that it's not executable. So you can't accidentally run it without setting the executable permission again. So on a Unix system, that's just chermod minus x executable, so taking away, um, you know, execute right from a program, in this case called executable. Um, and we just also want to make sure that the software that we're using to process these files aren't vulnerable though, because you can't trust that the, it's going to be a normal executable file. So the, the the good example of that is the strings command. I think it was just earlier this year where there was buffer overflow discovered in strings where you could run, you know, and you guys probably you know what strings is. It's a command for extracting all the ASCII text out of a, a binary file. You run that, um, and it's very common to do that as part of forensics work and, you know, just invest, you know, in, as part of an investigation. You've got some file you want to, a file that you want to know more about, you run strings against it. As it turns out, there was a buffer overflow in that program so that if you maliciously crafted a certain type of file and you ran strings against it, you'd take control of that 
would take control over strings and be able to run so, so you know take you know make stuff happen on that computer so again we need to make sure that the software we're using we're fairly confident in it if we're going to be processing anything to do with malware because we know it's malicious in intent to start with um, so it's probably a good idea to be working in a virtual machine even if you're doing static analysis it's you know not a bad idea or at least have a computer that you are willing to um, sacrifice basically and re-image when, when need be so you guys all know about one way hash functions by now basically it gives you a signature exact signature of an exact file and you guys we did that in the integrity management topic within this module so there are commands like md5sum and sha-sum which you know actually use the md5 or the sha um, one way hash function and it creates a um, basically a signature of that file and if a single bit of that file changes the signature changes completely um, so as a way of detecting malware what do you think the advantages are, or disadvantages are of that approach if we use hashes what, why do you think it might be a bad idea well, well, well. Mm -hmm. so yeah, so the malware might change its own code and then the, then it's not going to match. Yeah, very good. Yeah. MD5 is map collisions well. Yeah, that's true. So MD5 is actually like a cryptographically broken. So it is possible to generate two different things that have the same MD5 hash. So yeah, that's another good, good reason not to use that. Um, yeah, so that, ba and basically there are um, a lot of instances of malware that are almost the same but they're not the same so you know you might have a derivative of um, you know a certain virus someone might take the code from Stuxnet and just change it slightly and re-release that now if you're using hashes they wouldn't match anymore so you basically you've lost the ability to detect the attack um, and often they intentionally create multiple forms of the same virus to avoid detection. Um, an executable packer is basically a piece of software that will compress um, an executable program um, and create a version of that program which then decompresses itself and runs. And there are legitimate reasons for that and malicious reasons for that. So a legitimate purpose might be that I compile a program and it's just this massive executable file. I can run an executable packer against that to create a smaller <coughs> version of that same program and distribute that. Um, but it's now pretty much a lot harder to look at that code and understand how it works because it's been compressed. Unless we you know, decompress it, um, we you know, extract that file out, then we can get the original back again. So that's like one thing where it, by using a, a, um, a packer, it will change the um, the file completely basically but when you run it the same thing happens so the, this is an example um, UPX it's um, GPL code and you can actually use it on most operating systems so you can use it on Windows um, executables or Linux or Mac so this is just a small example where I've just run the program against some um, random executable that I've called malware um, and it's basically, you can see here, the file size has become a lot smaller. Um, and when you type, type ls, you've just still got that same program sitting there, but now uh, it's different. So if you saw on that last slide where I ran um, SHA-1 against it, um, this has a completely different signature, but it's the same file. So there's often there'll be multiple layers of packers so a malware will maybe start off with just a basic compression packer and then it might use like a, an encryption packer so that it, it will uh, you know obfuscate the code so that you can't um, easily see what it is anymore and it might run through a number of different um, encryption methods to like change how that file is stored on the disk and you can rerun that over and over again until you end up with something like completely different and really hard to get back again without, you know, running through it all. Basically, the easiest way is just to let the code run, and it will find its way into memory. But then, that's dynamic analysis, right? So if we want to stick to static analysis and not running that program, it can be very hard 
to kind of reverse engineer out the original code. Um, so sometimes the yeah they'll basically include like a um, instead of just compression it will have like an encryption method basically and when you start the program that decryption code will start up it'll read that um, the, the encrypted version of the code and get it back to the result which might be another packed um, you know encrypted code which then decrypts and then it gets the next one out and then it decrypts that until finally we get the, the actual program running on the computer so um, back to what you know Matthew mentioned uh, about viruses that actually change themselves there's a few different versions of ways that they do that so there's polymorphic code which is where the stored code changes each time but the outcomes the same so that's like what I just talked about with um, the, the decryption thing where it's encrypted and decrypts itself uh, it might actually change the the code that's used for the encryption and decryption so that that's not detected uh, there's also metamorphic code which is where the executed code changes each time so the program as itself changes not only are we storing it differently but it might like add a bunch of no ops so like their instructions that do nothing within the code they might use different instructions that ach achieve the same thing so for example instead of using a certain registry in the CPU to store something it stores it into a different registry instead for example it does the same thing but the codes different uh, it might have some it might reorder the, the order that, that the code happens in the same um, as long as the same outcome ha you know happens then you know it's probably safe to reorder certain parts of the code that aren't dependent on each other and it will still work the same way it might add some extra loops in so there's a few extra while loops and you know some just things happening in the code so what that means is if you just got a snapshot of what's in the memory that's not going to be the same either so you can't rely on that as a way of detecting that it's the same malware so one of the solutions is fuzzy hashing where it's basically a hash that can identify similar files so there's a program called ssdeep um, which is another program written by um, a guy called Andrew Tridgell. You'll remember he also created um, rsync, which we talked about in the past. And he's um, one of the main contributors to the Samba project, which is like Windows file sharing on Unix systems. Um, so anyway, he created this soft, uh, actually he created the algorithm, the software's written by someone else. So, um, but basically it works based on what's known as context triggered piecewise hashes and basically to quote what the, the way they describe it sequences of identical bytes in the same order although bytes in between those sequences may be different in both content and length so basically it's looking for certain things within it but it, does, it doesn't it, it, it can uh, allow for some changes and it will still detect that it's similar basically and there's an example here where I basically got a, um, a few different versions of the same program and I've just made some minor modifications to them and you can see here that it um, when you run ssdeep against it it basically says malware 2 and malware 3 both match that malware 2 or and malware original both match that malware 2 um, version of it it didn't match the um, the packed version but it did match all the other versions where I just made slight alterations so it can detect that the programs are, are, are similar. Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> so they're the same file, obviously. Um, so mal yeah. So I copied malware original to so to clarify what that is. Malware two is the same as the original version. Malware three is malware two with some slight changes to it, and malware was the packed version so yeah you can you can basically ignore that original version because it's the same as that one but um but yeah so it, it says that they basically these ones match um and they don't match this completely different program so it's quite it seems to be quite good from what i from this very limited testing it succeeded and you can see here what the um the actual hash looks like it's, it's that basically um so yeah, um, so obviously a, a, a very um, sane approach would be to actually run the program through the anti some antivirus software, right? It's a pretty good place to start. So we can, you know, use 
whatever antivirus software we want and run it against that and see whether it detects it. And they're going to use like a number of techniques, including like a signature-based technique. And usually, they'll have their own form of fuzzy hashing. So <coughs> they will have developed various ways of matching different kinds of malware, and you know they probably don't use the same fuzzy hashing algorithm as SSDeep does, but they use you know various kinds of of matching techniques. So. Um, you know, if we're using Linux, we can run ClamAV, which is open source anti-malware, um, which you guys will actually write some malware signatures for. And um, but you know, if you're on Windows um, or or on Linux, there's also a bunch of other options. There's like there's so many different antivirus options out there. So some, for example, are Avast, AVG Free, and you know, there's a whole bunch of them basically. Um, if you're on Windows system, there's Microsoft Security Essentials, which is um, like Microsoft's free antivirus solution, or Windows Defender is also like a an antivirus tool. Um, but it relies on each of those companies basically maintain their own database of malware that they've found and they've analyzed. So what that means is every different antivirus program out there will detect a different set of malware. So you know, if you happen to be running one over another, it might change whether or not it detects a certain certain piece of malware that makes its on its way onto your systems. So there are also some online scanners. Virus Total's um, good. Actually, I think Virus Total may have been bought by Google or something. So, but but Virus Total is one where you can basically you can upload your sample and it compares it against a whole you know plethora. Of antivirus programs, so it'll try using McAfee. It'll use, um, you know, Norton. It'll use, you know, AVG Free and all these different things, and it will tell you which of them detect detected the sample as being virus and what what it detected it as. Um, but they're, obviously, if they're online, usually by uploading to the service, you're basically you're agreeing that they can then take that sample and use it themselves. And that sample will probably make its way into the hands of the various antivirus products and stuff. So you know, um, if you have a zero-day malware, it probably won't stay zero-day if you start uploading it to services like that. So, which is not not necessarily a bad thing, obviously, um, but just something to keep in mind. So anti-malware um, can give you false positives and false negatives, right? So a false positive is where it says that the file is malware, but it's not. So, um, for example, it, um, it detects payloads created from um, Metasploit based on a few things, partly because of the template that it uses to generate executable files. But that template might also happen to match some actual legitimate executable files that exist, and therefore those will get matched as being you know, malicious files when they're not. Um, but also, it, it might say it's not malware when it is, which is obviously the case if there's any new malware, so zero-day malware. So something that's brand new, it's not going to know that it's malware usually. The, they'll do some things to try and detect that it's similar to other malware that's existed, but generally, if you write your own malware, there's a pretty good chance that it's not going to de get detected by anything. So using if you use lots of vendors for your antivirus, it can increase your chances that you're getting accurate data. But if you're using Windows, it's not a good idea to have multiple antivirus products installed at the same time, just because it just it doesn't handle it very well. They you say each other are viruses, basically. That's how it Sorry? It. Like they basically say, like, oh, uh, Norton's a virus, <laughs> and then Norton will try and block AVG. <laughs> this goes crazy. Yeah, and you end up with a very slow computer. Um, and yeah, it, it used to, w I mean, I. Uh, yeah, like in the 90s, I used to have like multiple antivirus programs installed on, my, on a Windows system at once, and it worked fine. But yeah, over the last few years, it's just they don't play nice anymore. The, it just literally slows your computer down to a crawl. Um, and yeah, they'll detect each other as like trying to hook into the operating system, and therefore it looks like it's doing something suspicious. Um, so, okay, so we decided we want to look at the malware for ourselves because we tried antivirus and it didn't detect it, for example. Or we it did, but we want to know more about the about it than what's publicly known. 
So the first thing we could, thing we could do is just look at the hex, which is literally just what's stored on disk, like byte for byte, what's there on the di disk. You can use hash dump um, command to do that, and the dash c tells you to give you the like the nice kind of like what you see in NK. So you're looking at it, and it's got like the memory location, the contents, and then the um, like the ASCII representation. You can get that with the the dash capital C in hex dump. Obviously, you could just fire up whatever your favorite forensics tool is. So you could open up in case if you happen to be lucky enough to have a license um, or you know FTK image or you know whatever you want whatever software you want you could open up um, and some malware and look at the hex for it right very basic um, way of looking at it it's not going to might not mean anything to you though because it's just going to look like you know gibberish um, but you might be able to see some ASCII text that happens to be in there so any messages that um, that is within the code might display. You can also try extracting an ASCII. So rather than trying to read through the binary on a hex editor to detect it for yourself, you can run it through like strings, for example. Um, and as we know nowadays, you should use strings minus A instead of just strings, because um, strings tries to be clever and runs it through all sorts of complicated code when really all you want to do is extract strings. So. Anyway, if you just use strings minus a and then the actual path to where the executable is, that'll give you out just all the plain text that's in there. And that might give you some, some clues, like maybe some IP addresses are in there. That could be quite interesting. So you might see what IP addresses it's actually going to automatically connect to because that might be hard coded into the program. Um, you know, or various you know, messages that w it would display on the screen or anything like that. Names of registry entries that it's using. Um, but if the program has been run through a packer, then you're not going to find anything out by using these techniques. So if you run it, look at the hex and look at try and extract uh, ASCII. If it's been compressed or encrypted, then there's basically there's you won't get anything back. It'll just all be like, you know, when you're looking at an encrypted file, it's just like all um, gibberish basically. Yes. Yeah. You can, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Y if you're lucky, you can. Um, and that's if they haven't stripped debug symbols from the compiled version of the software. Most like sophisticated malware won't have that in it. But yeah, if you've just got a piece of software, sometimes the developers will be lazy and leave debug symbols in, and you can literally, yeah you can get all that information out even the source code and everything but think for nowadays for like actual sophisticated malware it wouldn't be the case but yeah it's still something you would definitely check for so just to remind you guys like the life cycle of some code right so someone writes some software and it, if it's malware it's probably written in C but it could be written in any language at all that gets compiled down to machine instructions generally right if we talk talking in, in generalizations, but most malware, it, it, well, it gets compiled down to machine instructions. So that's basically represented as assembly code. So on a CPU, you've got registers, which are places where stuff's stored. And there are instructions that basically use those registers to like add things together. You can add that register to that register. You can move one register to another. Or you can process something, compare two things together. That's basically you know, what the but that's the set of instructions that a computer understands. So that's basically stored in an executable file format. So the assemb it goes from a high level language like high level like C to like low level CPU instructions in assembly code, which is machine code, which is basically like zeros and ones that eventually it turns into. And then that gets stored within an executable file format. Um, and depending on the operating system, it's going to be in a different format. So if we're talking about um, like Linux systems, it'll be in an ELF file, executable and linkable format file. Um, so and all most Unix systems do that as well, except Mac OS X has its own one, which is Mac O, and Windows has portable executable format, so PE. Or on 64-bit version of Windows, it's PE32 plus. <laughs> I don't know why they don't call it 64, just to like just to catch people out, I think. But um, so yeah, portable executable is like the for file format of a program for Windows, basically. So if you looked at those pro at those files, they
they contain all sorts of interesting information. So it includes metadata, which includes the date that the program was compiled and the version number of the software. Uh, it includes linking information. So for example, does it use libraries on the computer itself? So if, it, if it's using local libraries, that information is there. The code itself that's been compiled, so I mean like machine code, it might have debug symbols and the source code included in, in there as well if it's been compiled that way. It'll have the variables, so particularly like global variables and stuff will be declared in, in a separate part of that file as well. And if there's like an icon for, for, the, for the executable or something, that's stored in there as well. So there's all this information is all in the one file, which includes the machine code for running the program. So if we want to find out about that, there are some tools we can use that can help us. Yeah? So was that like basic architecture that said for example, yeah. Yes. So .exe file is in the um, the the portable executable format uh, for Windows, and then that basically says how the, that information is laid out. So it'll have like the icon file and like all that stuff all stored within it. Um, so there are some tools you can use to extract information out of files. So on a Unix system, there's this awesome program just called File. And if you type file space some program name, it'll tell you a lot about it. It does, it does all sorts of clever things to extract metadata out. So for example, if you type file space some JPEG dot JPEG and run that, it'll tell you like the dimensions of the JPEG, it'll tell you it's an image file and all sorts of like clever stuff, even if it's not dot JPEG. If you rename a JPEG file to GIF and you run file against it, it'll say this is a JPEG file. Because um, like, so it's looking at the contents of the file to figure out what it is. So you can point that in an executable, and it will tell you that you look whether or not it actually is an executable, and some other information. So it'll say whether it's an ELF executable or, you know, PE executable. Um, you can use the the command extract, and that does the same thing. It's just um, a, well, basically, extracts even more metadata out. Um, so you can use that against um, programs and other files. But if we're specifically talking about examining executable files, there are some tools we can do that. So there's read elf, and that'll um, display information about elf files, including debug symbols and things like that, which might be interesting. Um, so if there are debug symbols, then we might actually see the names of all the functions and things like that, which can be helpful. You can use um, like object dump or ob obj dump, however you want to say that, which is a dis disassembler. So it generates the assembly code for a um, for a program. So you could point it at either Windows or a Linux executable and it will give you the assembly code. And you can go a step further than that and actually try and obtain C code or something like that. You can use different programs that will actually go that extra step of trying to generate higher level code that describes it. Um, you can use D, um, LDD which will tell you linking for Linux systems, like what libraries it uses. PE scanner um, is for Windows executables. You can run that and it will detect packers. Um, so it, there are certain well-known packers, and it will actually detect that they're there. So it'll say, you know, this has this packer, and then this packer, and this packer, for example. And it can do that extraction for you to get back the original version before um, it's been um, packed, basically. Um, but then if it doesn't, if it can't recognize the packer, it might not be able to do anything about it. But there are a number that it does know about. So there are some sort of advanced reverse engineering tools you can use, like. Um, God, I wouldn't even know. How, I don't know how you pronounce that. Um, Piu. Does that sound right? <laughs> Piu. Um, Radar uh, and uh, the interactive uh, disassembler IDA, which is very popular. Um, IDA Pro is um, quite good for reverse engineering code, and it can do all sorts of things like this, where you can see. This is quite a small picture here, but you can see it gives you like assembly code and like how the pieces of assembly code are related to each other. So you can make things like a lot easier if you're trying to analyze some um, some low level assembly instructions to figure out how it, you know this loops around here, for example. And if it's all um, laid out with diagrams and visually, it's a lot easier to see what's happening. Um, so you can disassemble. Uh, and look at the assembly code and um, a lot of these tools will do some of the stuff we've just been talking about. So it will automatically detect packing and it will, can do the unpacking for you automatically and everything like that. So you can say, I want to look at this program and then it says, there's a package, you want to look at what's in that? Yes, and then it'll like unpack that and then it'll say, it looks like another packer. Do you want to unpack that too? 
and then you can eventually see the actual instructions. So Clam AV um, is um, obviously antivirus software for for Linux. I think there's a Windows version as well, but it's like it's open source antivirus. Um, if you run this command, so clam scan, uh, debug, leaf, temps, and on an executable, it will actually unpack automatically. It it does the clam um, scan, obviously, um, and it, it gives you a lot of detailed information about what it's doing, including unpacking files and things. And if you have that leave temps, it'll leave a copy on the computer for you of the unpacked files. So then if you're writing your own signatures, you can write them against the unpacked one rather than the packer. Um, why would you do, like, why do you think it's a better idea to write antivirus on the unpacked file rather than the packed file? Even more likely to be running it once if there's a problem, especially on Linux. I'd say mm -hmm. most people, and especially on home systems, won't be running antivirus on Linux. Right. And the only time they're going to do it is if they get a problem. I'd say even on servers, people probably. Right. A lot of. So, obviously, if you've only got it against the packed and the packed's yeah. been destroyed once it's got a live version on there. Yeah. Well, yeah, so the, the packed version is the version that's stored on disk, and unpacked is like the uncompressed version of that. Um, the. It's worth pointing out Clam AV <coughs> detects Windows viruses and not just Linux ones. So a lot of the times it's used on a Linux server that's acting as like a mail server or something to like detect malicious attachments and stuff like that. Um, and yes, what you're saying is is not that far from the truth. Um, but generally speaking, it will automatically unpacks it every time it tries to do a scan. And if you write the rules against the packed version, then all they need to do is repack it and the rule stops working. But if you write it against the unpacked version, then if they repack it in a different way, if the antivirus is able to depack it, then it will still match the same signature. So um, there's a tool called SigTool, which you can use. Um, the most basic kind of signature you can use in ClamAV is based on a one-way hash function. Um, so you can do SigTool dash dash MD5, and then the malware, and then you can output that to a file, you know, which is basically this, the same as what we do when we use um, MD5 sum, and we send the, the, the result to a file, except that it's in the file format that um, the ClamAV wants. And it looks like this. So it's got like the MD5 hash, and then some other information, and then the name of the, the malware. Uh, by default, it uses the name of the file, but you can change that to whatever you want. You can say virus, evil thing, or whatever, you know, whatever it is. Um, and obviously that's a bad idea for the reasons we've already talked about, right? We don't want to have hash. We don't want to have antivirus signatures based on like hash, um, one-way hash functions because it's too fragile. It's too easy to avoid the detection. Um, can also include hash-based signatures with wildcards, so which is known as extended or um, hex wildcard-based um, signature format. So you can have, um, it's basically in this format. So you've got sig the malware name and then the target type. Um, in offsets and hash signatures and stuff. So basically you've got bits of um, content that you're going to look for within the file. Um, and that's that's a better way of doing it. So you're looking for a specific sets of instructions and things like that. But it also has uh, other kinds of um, signatures and processing so it can like do matches against HTML and it does, looks at, you can, you can get it to check the metadata attached to an executable and combinations of signatures and things like that. So it's quite good and this is good um, documentation about that and we'll be doing that in the lab uh, week after next I'll get you to actually write your own malware signatures so how are we going for time well that was it so next week we will have a lecture and I'll talk about dynamic analysis which is the other half of the story for malware analysis and um, so that's all for this week <coughs>